Welcome to our second talk, entertainment slash evening session for the semester um, in our series, Conversations with Communicators. Um, my name is Saskia Bitterborn and I'm the head of the graduate division for the School of Communication and Journalism, or the other way around. Um, and uh, we've had the pleasure of having our first talk last Saturday when we had the um, business editor of the New York Times here in a different building up there. And today it's my pleasure um, introducing Mr. Vivek Mahubani, um, who I think is probably well known to many of you. Um, and he will talk for about uh, 50 minutes and then um, I will kind of start with some questions and then you of course very welcome to ask your questions as well. So just as a very brief introduction, um, for those of you who have not heard of um, Vivek before, um, he's a man born in Hong Kong. He's bilingual, so you can ask his qu your questions in English or in Cantonese. I'm not sure, Vivek, what your Putangua kind of. Yeah, okay, so perfectly kind of Cantonese. And so he is a bilingual stand-up comedian, and he's pretty famous by now in Hong Kong and in many other parts of the world, uh, performing both in Cantonese and English. And he has been crowned funniest person in Chinese in Hong Kong in 2007, so that's a pretty long time ago already, um, followed by his victory in the English category at the Hong Kong International Comedy Competition in 2008. And uh, Vivek had the opportunity to take his sense of humor to many other parts of Asia, including China, Macau, also Singapore, Malaysia, Manila, Bangkok, Sri Lanka, and India. And um, having been ranked also as the top comedian in Hong Kong in 2014, um, the world famous Laugh Factory in the US ranked Vivek as one of the top 10 comedians in their annual Funniest Person in the World competition. That's pretty cool, I think. 2015, he was handpicked as one of the comedians to represent Asia's Best in Melbourne in the International Comedy Festival. Um, and also in 2016, and that's pretty big, I think, um, he was featured in Comedy Central's first ever Stand Up Asia shows. Um, and here I have a little piece of information. One of Vivek's passions is reading his favorite book, The Arts of War. And I'm also happy to report that his favorite color is hot pink. So without further ado, let's welcome Vivek. Right, thank you very much. First of all, thank you guys for coming to this uh, lecture slash entertainment section. Uh, my name is Vivek, and I must say thank you for saying my name correctly. That's a very rare thing here in Hong Kong. People always mess my name up. Uh, my name is Vivek, and I was born and raised here in Hong Kong. I speak fluent Cantonese as well as I was introduced because I went to a Chinese school. Now what would happen is on the first day of every year, I would look forward to that day the most because that's the first day where you get roll call, right? And the teacher has to call out each new student's name. And I always wait, what will this teacher this year call my name? How would he or she pronounce my name? My name is Vivek, V-I-V-E-K. Every year, a new variation. One year, a teacher sees my name, and he's like, um, whack, whack. <laughs> right? I've been called We Wet. I've been called Vicky. I've been called Victor. I've been called Victoria. <laughs> but the absolute best was one year for a roll call. This teacher, full of confidence, looks at my name, looks at me, very confidently just says, John. <laughs> I was like, how do you spell John? This is crazy, right? I hope you don't teach English. But uh, the thing I want to say is that I've been a comedian for around 10 years now, and I find this really interesting because um, initially when I first began doing stand-up comedy, it was purely just, I love comedy. I loved watching it, I wanted to try it, and that was all that mattered to me. But without my realizing it is that I had to talk about something. And usually when you start in comedy, you always go from your history, your identity, you know, who you are, what you think, and all that stuff. So I would start talking about that kind of stuff. And without realizing it, I was touching upon social issues that, you know, I did not know was an issue. I just thought it's just a funny situation or just a weird thing. Like people can't pronounce my name, you know, stuff like that. That's actually an issue. A lot of people have trouble. So you, like for example, in Hong Kong, most of people just call me Avi, letter V, Avi, that's it, right? And I kind of got used to that. But some people tell me, why? Why do you want that? And I would think to myself, well, for me, I just keep it simple. If you can't even say the letter V, then forget it, right? We don't have to be friends. 
But I felt like, you know, this works out. People call me something, I respond, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter that everyone has to say, Mr. Mabubani, Mr. Mabu. I don't need that. I don't have time. By the time you say my whole name, I would have gone already, right? You know, so that was the issues. However, I would start talking jokes about my family, about what happened to me in school. For example, when I was in school, right, I was the only non-Chinese kid in my class. And in primary school, without realizing it, you know, you're young, you're six years old, you don't really think of race. You just see someone looking different. So a bunch of six years old, uh, six year olds in class, I go to the classroom, I'm sitting down, you know, and the teacher walks in, and one classmate's like, teacher, how come we have an alien in the class? <laughs> Now for a six-year-old boy, that's awesome. I'm like, I'm an alien, what? This is so cool, yeah, right? <laughs> then another classmate raises his hand, teacher, we're a boys' school. How come there's a girl in the class? And I said, like, what, I'm a girl now? They don't know that, nobody told me that. And I asked him, why do you think I'm a girl? And he said, oh, because you have long eyelashes. I said, oh, I get it, so long eyelashes equals girl. So I went home, I told my mom, mom, I decided I'm gonna be a boy. My mom was like, I, I'm, I'm, what, what do you mean? I said, like, I'm going to cut my eyelashes. <laughs> and my mom would tell me, when I was, I was six years old, so all I cared about was cutting off your boy. She's like, no, they're, they're beautiful. Don't cut your eyelashes. They're fantastic. Now, the good thing is that I did not cut them, which is why I have longer eyelashes now. And it's really useful now at this age, because a lot of ladies will walk up and be like, wow, your eyelashes are so beautiful. Your face, not so much, but the eyelashes, wow, wow, right? Now you think about what just happened over there. The story was that, you know, this, this young kid, six-year-old kid, goes, to, goes into a class, everyone else is Chinese, he happens to be non-Chinese, and he's getting told he's an alien, you know, someone called me a monster, stuff like that. But the cool thing was, because my mentality was like, oh, monsters are cool, aliens are cool, you know, stuff like that. However, that never stopped. People would always label me as something. For example, at this age, I still, you know, people come up to me maybe as a joke, or just, you know, someone makes a side comment. And they're like, oh, you know, you look like a terrorist. And, you know, I know, and I'm like, come on, really a terrorist in Hong Kong, really, am I gonna be that, you know, that silly to do that? But I thought about it, I was like, you know what? Don't get me wrong. I don't, it doesn't offend me when someone tells me that. It just gets really boring. I'm like, really, we're still doing the terrorist joke, guys, you know? Come on, and people can, anyone. Bombing is not limited to any ethnicity. Bombing is a free thing to do, right? And I always say, I'm Indian though. Like, we're not into the whole bombing thing. Think about it. The only time you would ever get a bomb from an Indian person is after a night of going to an Indian restaurant and eating Indian curry, right? Because the next morning, you wake up, you feel your stomach, you're like, oh, it's inside. You know? We are such spiritual people that even when we give you a bomb, it comes from within you, you know? <laughs> I keep telling people, like, it doesn't make sense. Why would you always label? What, what is the need to label? So the thing with comedy, I'm able to talk about these topics and people are willing to listen because there's a punchline at the end. There's something they want to hear, which is a joke, right? And I do that because I, that's how I handle situations. That's how I handle these problems. I try to find the funny angle. I try to look at it and be like, you know what? Maybe look at it this way. It's kind of silly. So I even talk about how looking like a terrorist actually has its benefits. So all you guys, I'm sorry you missed out on this bet, this privilege, because while you, like normal people, would just go line up for a bus, let's say you take the minibus, right? You line up. I don't need to. I just cut the queue, get on the bus, everyone's like, you know what? I'll take the next bus, it's okay, I don't want to die, it's okay, <laughs> right? So with that angle, suddenly now, this so-called terrorist look is actually a good thing. Same like my eyelashes, same like my body hair. When I was in secondary school, my classmates used to make fun of me. Uh, what are you, a monkey? <laughs> What's wrong, right? And it, I would get bored because like, I'm like, that's too easy. You're a monkey. Come on, guys. You know, like, get creative, at least. So I would then try to fight back, but I would never fight physically. I would try to fight out with my friends. So I would say, you know, do you know how good it is to have body hair? In summer, I don't get mosquito bites, okay? The mosquitoes will fly and get stuck in my hair. It's fantastic. Right? So of course my friend's like, really? That's so cool. Can I have some hair? Can I have some hair? Right? So the whole idea was that with comedy, it allows you to talk about certain topics that, you know, normal conversation would be like, oh, you know, that's politically incorrect. That's insensitive. Don't talk about that. But when you turn it into a comedy, into like a joke, suddenly we're like, oh, it softens the blow. There's a formula called comedy equals tragedy plus time. So usually when a, when a person tells you a joke, Behind the scenes, there's actually a really sad story about it. Very rarely 
what we kind of look for, you know, what we laugh at something that's really positive. Nobody cares about when you, you, you won the mark six, no one cares about that. What we do care about is, you know, if you slipped and you fell. That's funny to us, right? Nobody cares about, you know, if you're happy with your girlfriend, no one cares. We want to hear when you broke up with your girlfriend, what happened, right? That's all we want to care about. So it's actually tragedy plus time. Lucky for me is that over the years, I kind of got used to this identity issue to the point that I would play with it. So when I was in primary school, the whole alien factor, right? I kind of looked at it from a different angle, like, oh, I'm an alien, I can, I can get away with a lot of stuff. So, like, for example, my classmates would have, let's say, a box of chocolate milk, right? And he'd only finish half of it. And he'd be like, oh, I can't finish it. Anybody want it? And all my friends would say, ugh, saliva, it's a disease, stuff like that, right? And that's when I can come in, oh, we aliens have no sickness, give me the chocolate, I'll do that, right? And he's like, oh, okay, whatever, you're fine, and I'll take that. So, it's all about how you look at things. So, with comedy, what's interesting is that suddenly it kind of overlooks what's politically correct. It's simply in the context of you get what I'm saying. So many times when I joke about life in Hong Kong, we laugh about it because we're like, yeah, that's what we all do. But actually for an outsider, it's like, why do you do this? This doesn't make sense. So I'll give you an example. Uh, many times reporters will question me and say, hey, babe, you know, you're a comedian. You know, are you a happy person? Are you optimistic? And I kept thinking, what is happiness really, right? This is a very philosophical of happiness. So you know, you think about everywhere around the world, happiness is very different from, the, from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is somehow unique in that sense of values of happiness. So for example, anywhere else in the world, you ask someone, what's happiness? It might be very simple, you know, being with my family, or just being healthy, stuff like that. But in Hong Kong, that's happiness, but that's not real Hong Kong happiness. Hong Kong happiness is not with the family and walking on the beach and stuff like that. Happiness is when you are alone in the lift and your friend or classmate is running towards the lift and your hand presses the door closed button, <laughs> right? Because as your friend is running and the lift doors are closing, your happiness keeps increasing. You're like, yes, <laughs> yes, right? Without realizing that's how it works, right? So think about it. By using that theory, actually, the happiest job, the stereotypical idea of, you know, a lawyer, doctor, banker, those are not the happiest jobs anymore by that theory. The happiest job, at least here in Hong Kong, are the MTR train drivers. Because all they do all day is just wait for people running to the train, they're like, bye-bye. Right? So it's the only thing, so really what is happening over here is that we're able to talk about issues that we all kind of know, but maybe don't talk about. So for example, people will tell me, you know, when I, when I talk about that issue, let's say in, uh, in Melbourne, for the, I went to Melbourne to do shows, right? And I would talk to reporters, yeah, that's where we find happiness. They're like, that's so rude. Why would you close the door on your friend? And I was thinking, you're right, because I never thought of it as a rude thing. It's kind of like, you know, you as I win, that's the way we go, right? But over there, it's so different, because I never realized that when I get in the lift, I automatically look for the door close button. But when I was in Australia, many lifts don't have a door close button. And I realized how weak I felt. I was like, huh? What do I do? Do I just wait? Is my destiny controlled by this box? Right? And it's all these things. So the idea really is that by telling a joke, you're able to realize certain things that we kind of just either take for granted or never realize was an issue. So discrimination is one of these great topics you can talk about in, in comedy. And lucky for me, a ethnic minority, living in Hong Kong, discrimination easy, right? I can get it all the time. However, the thing is that discrimination has different levels. So for example, it takes a lot of effort to upset me simply because I've gotten tired of it. I always tell people, it's not that I don't find discrimination wrong or bad, I just have no time for it. I'm too busy, what do you want? You know, tell me, go straight, tell me what you need to do. The thing though is that, what happened to me one time that, it, that, made, that left a really strong impression was, I was walking on the street, right? So I'm walking and everything, this guy bumps into me. And he was really upset. In Canada, it's safe, I don't, I'm gonna say I don't, right? <laughs> now normally, I don't get upset. You know, when people curse at me or whatever, I'm like, I don't care, I got stuff to do anyway. But that day, I was really upset. And I was like, you know what, I gotta tell this guy off. This is not right. I was like, what? We got tired. Because the term for a brown ethnic minority, especially Indian man, is ata. The term for a Caucasian is guaylo. And I was more upset that he got the term wrong. I was like, how disrespectful are you that you did not even do your homework to learn how to insult me correctly? Where I'm correcting you, my like, sir, that's not how you do it. All right? Don't call me white. I'm not white. It's wrong, right? So this is the thing, though, is that. I find it funny because I'm looking at it from a perspective of like, I can't believe he insulted me incorrectly. Whereas the next guy might be like, the whole situation is just wrong. 
So comedy kind of forces you to look at the world from a different angle, which in, over time becomes a habit, where you no longer look for like what's right or wrong. You're looking for like, you know, what's interesting, and you ask yourself why. So for example, why is it that we find happiness or we enjoy the fact that we're in the lift and someone else could not make the lift? Why is it that when we take the minibus, we automatically line up and immediately count how many people are in front of us? Right? They're like, okay, okay, I'm number one, two, three, I'm number four, okay, number four, good. Yeah. Why is it that you know when we're lining and the minibus arrives, that you look around how many seats and you are happy to get on the bus? But you are extremely happy when you know you are number four and the bus only has four seats left. <laughs> and you're just like, because of me, number five can't get on. Right? Like even for me, sometimes in my head I'll start singing songs. I'm like, I'm number four, you're number five. Five in Chinese is mmm. Mm also means no mmm. Right? I would do these silly things, but why? Why is that? Right? So I keep asking myself, why is that? Why is it that over here it's always a win-lose mentality? But it's also the things that, it's also the game. The game of Hong Kong is if you don't get in now, you, nobody gets in, right? You, you lose that. But that's how it is. And it actually becomes part of your habit. So when I go travel, I automatically do these kind of things. And you actually notice, oh yeah, you're right. People are so polite over here. People are so rude over here. But really, is Hong Kong really a rude place? I don't think so. I think it's okay. We're just really busy. I always say, Hong Kong's not a safe city, it's not a polite city. We have no time for your manners and your safety. We don't have time to rob you. I got stuff to do, right? So the thing is that as a comedian, all you're really doing is looking at everything and asking questions. Why? Why is it this way? Why is it that way? And trying to find a way to explain it. That's a very simple technique of the basic new perspective, right? So by doing that, I'm able to talk about issues that we kind of maybe don't talk about, we kind of ignore, or we don't even realize existed until someone brings it up. So a prime example, this is one of my oldest jokes I have in my artillery, right? It's about me getting stopped by the police to get my ID card checked. This is a super classic joke to the point that when people hire me for private parties, they always are like, hey, Viv, you're going to do the ID card joke? And first of all, I have to clarify, as a comedian, I'm not karaoke. You don't get to tell me which joke to tell, right? I say the joke that I want to say. However, like, oh, the ID card, because I'm like, fine. So this is the ID card joke that actually is based on a true story. All right, I'm walking home, minding my own business. Walking, 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 and of course the policeman sees me. I'm alone, it's two in the morning. What does he do? You, ID card, right? So I'm like, ah, just take my ID card. Now he takes my ID card. It is so obvious this gentleman cannot pronounce my name because the moment he gets my card, sees my full name on, he's like, come on, I got a one bit. What? Right? And for some reason he starts. He's, he's like doing this. He's like. What, like the distance will make a difference, really? <laughs> wow, what a difficult name. Oh, I'm short-sighted. This is easy, okay? Now the guy, maybe he was nervous or something. So it's, while he was doing this, at the same time, he was like shaking one of his legs. He was like, you know, doing this like, what are you doing, pumping knowledge? What is this? Right? So he's looking at my car, trying to guess my name. And the whole time, I'm just standing there like, <laughs> just being awkward. And finally, he's trying to guess it. Now, my surname is Mabuban, right? So that's letter M. Yeah, no, prove it. I love how the fact my surname is Mabubani. like, really? Oh, he's right. <laughs> Mabubani is a very typical Indian Sindhi surname. So the, the, the policeman obviously started looking at my name, okay, and yeah, surname starts at M, probably in his head, thinking like, you're looking to Middle East and whatever, right? So his best guess, of course, was not Mabubani, but his best guess was Mohammed, right? <laughs> I know, I know. But he did not even pronounce it as Mohammed. He called me Mohammed did. Like what, past tense? <laughs> Since when did Mohammed become a verb? <laughs> like you cannot use it, you can't be like, hey, uh, by the way, I Mohammeded you. Like what? <laughs> I don't know, what to do. I Jesus you back. I don't know how this is work, I'm confused, right? Now, of course, the guy who's got my name, she's all coughing, he's like, Mohammed did. Where are you going? Right? So I was like, uh, I'm just going home, so what, what is the problem? He's like, Mohammedan? From where you are come. He's like, what? what? From where you are come? What are you, Yoda from Star Wars? What is this, right? Now, I speak Cantonese, and usually at this point, I kind of say, look, you know what? I don't blame him. I get it, right? Let me speak Cantonese. Let me save the day. So I switched to Cantonese thinking, superpower time. I'm like, awesome. I'm like, 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 I'm
you think I don't speak English? <laughs> right? And I got in trouble for speaking Cantonese. Really? I can't do that? Now, the truth is that this story actually stems from a real situation where when I was younger, all the time, me and my classmates would go out. I was the only non-Chinese kid in the group. And what would happen is that when we would walk past the policeman, we'd have a game. We'd have a game called, Will Vivek get his ID card checked today? Right? <laughs> and if a policeman walks past us, and he checks my ID card, all my friends will give me one Hong Kong dollar each. Right? However, if he does not, I have to pay each of them one Hong Kong dollar back. Right? Let me tell you this, I made a lot of money. Okay? Oh, I was, I was making money good. However, you think about, why would this even happen? Why is it that I was the one getting stopped? Why was it that the policeman for some reason had to stop me? So I, I, I asked some people around, you know, is there a certain quota you gotta hit? There are actually some, some people actually have certain quotas of different ethnicities and stuff like that. But it was for some reason just constantly happening. I was like, why is this guy skipping all my friends? But once he sees me, he's like, you know what? I gotta get this guy. I'm like, really? I'm the random guy again. My luck is so good. However, what I never realized, when I first told this joke, it was just a joke I thought I dealt with. But the more people I've met, the more I realize this issue actually happens to a lot of ethnic minority youngsters, especially in different areas of Hong Kong. However, what I do find though is that this never happened to me in the central business districts, in Wan Chai, in Causeway Bay. It started happening to me from Tin Hao, you know, all towards the western, I mean the eastern side of Hong Kong Island. It never happened to me in Chim San Choi, never happened to me in Yao Mate, never happened to me in Mong Kok. Started happening to me to, in, in Sham Shui Po, going a little first, further north and stuff like that. It, it started happening to me to, let's say, in Tin Moon and stuff like that. And I was like, this is so strange. Why is it that I can do the same action in central? walk around, talk loudly, whatever, and guys are like, ah, that's how they do that, so that's how, they, how, how it goes over here. But the moment I do the same thing, let's say in Shang Shui Po, it's like, you, ID card, right? <laughs> it's a bizarre thing. So, over time, I kind of looked at like newspapers as well. I'm like, why is it that the, new, uh, the, the newspapers report uh, different people in a different way? Why am I an ethnic minority, whereas my Caucasian friend is an expat? Right? Why is it that you know when I let's say when my let's say my my Caucasian friend goes to Lanfong and gets drunk, it's like ah having a good time, right? When I go to Lanfong and have, get, get drunk, like oh look these poor people, you know can't even afford to they can't go to a bar, it's getting drunk on the streets, right? It's a weird thing. I don't know why. I would even joke about stuff like for example, um, dating and relationships. A lot of people ask about you know relationships in Hong Kong, and it's bizarre because like interracial inter, uh, inter -ra relationships are very common nowadays, it's no big deal. However, the races that are used are not always that diverse. So for example, let's say a typical Hong Kong Chinese girl goes out with let's say an American guy, let's say a, a Caucasian American guy, right? Goes back home, family's probably thinking, all right, this is all cool. But the moment she goes out with me, they kind of go like, wait, hold on, what happened right here? What's going on up here? Is this social service? You know, is this voluntary work? What's going on, right? And I always find it bizarre, I'm like, why is this an issue? Why do you feel like you kind of have to do a double take when it comes to someone of, let's say, this skin color? The reason is because like, there are a lot of uh, history behind uh, ethnic minorities and stuff like that, which in comedy I'm able to bring out. So for example, the term Wai Lo, right? Wai Lo is not really negative. We don't really feel, you know, oh, that's a really derogatory term. It still is racial, racist, right? You should not be calling people that, and actually it's illegal to call anyone a guaido, it's still considered racial discrimination. However, many, let's say, of my white friends themselves, they're like, hey man, I'm a guaido. They say it with pride. But I have never met a fellow brown man who says, I'm an acha. <laughs> you call me acha, never. Because the term acha is really weird. Now the history of the term acha is very fascinating to me. So uh, I, I did my homework, I know where it really came from, but my, my take was different. So I thought about it, like, no, why do you call us acha? So one of my stories I had before was that um, many years ago when Indians came to Hong Kong to work, we were so willing to work, we were so hardworking, we would just say yes to every job you get. Now in, the, in, in Hindi, in my own language, the word for yes or okay is acha, 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 which means okay, 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 right? So that is how the term acha came about, where these guys would just say acha to everything. So they were like, oh, call them acha, acha, right? So I was like, so wait a second. You use the word for okay or good in my language to become the racial term for my people. Do you know what the word for okay or good in Cantonese is? Ho, right? So now I'm gonna go around and tell people, hey, you're a ho. You're a bunch of hoes, right? Doesn't make sense, right? 
However, of course, the, the, the true history from based on what I've asked a lot of people and historians is that basically uh, the police, right? Uh, uh, the Hong Kong police force, a lot of them were like say Sikh and they were Indians, so they were called Chaya, right? Acha, that kind of thing. That became the common term for, let's say, brown skinned person, especially with, you know, a turban. Now, there's another term called Asin, which annoys me because people come up to me and they cannot say my name. They're like, can I call you Asin? I'm like, no, that's not my surname. You, they, I mean, you can call me, you know, Mohammed, or that's closer than your Asin, right? But uh, it doesn't make sense. But over the, over the years, I kind of realized, wait, this is actually a common thing, as in, like, people have assumptions. They see me. I go to. I go on radio stations. People assume I'm Indian, so I must be Hindi. I must be Sindhi. Now at home we spoke in English. At school we spoke in Cantonese. So I never really got a chance to learn my own language. However, day after day, situation after situation, I still get the expectation of like, all right, today we have a special guest and he's going to teach us some Indian words. I'm like what? <laughs> what? I never said that, right? I've been on radio before. They're like, we're so happy today. We have a B. We're going to have you learn about his culture of comedy and also Indian culture. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what do you want to learn? You know, B, what is the word for this in, Indian, in, in your Indian language? I'm like, oh, man, I'm dead now, right? <laughs> when I was young as well, when I was in school, I remember one of my classmates who was going to go to uh, India for a holiday. He said, hey, B, I'm going to go to India for a holiday. You know, I want to learn some Indian words. And I realized if I lied to him, he would not know. Right? He was like, hey, B, when I go to India, if I, if I see some Indian people, how do I say hello? So first of all, everybody, if you go to India and you see any Indian person, chances are they understand hello. Right? <laughs> Highly likely, anywhere in the world, people are like, hello, I know what that sounds like, right? But of course, I will not tell my friend that. I would mess with it. And I was like, oh, hello is very easy. Hello is Girikuru. He's like, oh, Girikuru. How do I say bye bye? I'm like, really? We're still doing this? Okay. Guru uh, Giri. He's like, okay, that's okay, right? Can you imagine my friend goes to India, walking around so proud, he's like, Giri Guru. Giri Guru. Right? He comes back to Hong Kong, he's like, hey, babe, uh, how come when I spoke to people who said Giri Guru, they, they were not responding to me? I'm like, really? That's, that's, say it to me once, maybe you're not saying the tones right, right? So he's like, okay, Giri Guru. I was like, ah, you know what? You gotta remember, whenever you talk to Indian people, you always must remember to shake your head, Guru. <laughs> if you don't know what you're saying. And he believed me. So that's another thing that comedy actually can use is stereotypes. However, there's a very fine line between stereotypes, joking, and bullying. What happens over time is that some comedians kind of go past that. Some comedians joke about it to the point it's like, come on, now you're being harsh. So for example, uh, many comedians will joke about Hong Kong people who can't speak good English, right? And have bad English, or have bad grammar, you know, or silly stuff like that. I understand that, but at a point it's like, really, you're just mocking someone's second language, right? So it's kind of rude in a way when you think about it. If a comedian comes like, so the other day, right, you know, this guy was at working at Welcome, and he was like, hey, welcome to Welcome. <laughs> I'm like, really? That, you think that's funny? And the, the, the guy's being honest, you aren't going to Welcome. He's saying welcome to welcome. What is wrong with that? He's like, yeah, but it sounds so silly. I'm like, well, he doesn't know that. That's his job. He's just saying that, right? However, over time, you will find that comedy kind of lets people step over the line because there is a bunch of audience who will laugh at that because it's a joke, right? We're just joking. Come on, we're just joking. But there's a problem, though. It's like you could joke at someone's expense. So, for example, when I made that joke about the policeman, when you really think about it, it could be at the policeman's expense. So now my responsibility is to not maybe, I mean, I could, I could decide not to do the joke, or I could learn how to craft it in a way where I'm not trying to push it down. I'm just trying to joke about the situation. So that's the craft of being able to communicate without actually bullying someone, but more like you're joking about the situation. So for example, I joke about how when I go to school, when I went to school before, my English was better than my teachers, right? And it was ridiculous, because I would have dictation, and I'd be like, you know, the teacher's like, okay, and the precious jewelry, I'm like, whoa, sir, it's not precious, it's precious. She's like, no, it's precious. I'm like, it's precious. That like, precious, precious. That like, P R E C I O U S, precious. I'm like, thank you very much, dictation. Right, <laughs> right. And you know, like back then, I would kind of find it funny, but I don't blame him because I'm like, look, the guy's trying. You know, he's doing his best effort. No, no, it's not. Maybe it's not his first language. Maybe he's not that native, and that's fine. But I could reverse it and say, God, man, I had the dumbest teachers ever. They couldn't even speak English. They were teaching me English. Like, come on, like you know. I could do it that way, and now it's like I'm, I'm, I'm basically mocking him. It's not so good, right? So a lot of situations I kind of do that. For example, I have a joke about names in Hong Kong. I'm sure we've all encountered someone with a very interesting English name, right? Or maybe yourself, you have a very interesting English name. 
So I'm gonna just ask, anybody know a friend who has a really cool English name to shout it out? You anybody have friends? What? Barbie, okay, Barbie, you know what, Barbie is relatively kind of like no big deal actually, Barbie. Cause like, yeah, it's a very common, I've actually, I know another Barbie as well, maybe it might be the same person, but Barbie's, I've heard Barbie, I've met someone called Money, right? <laughs> now the odd thing is not, it's not one, there's a couple of people I know called Money. However, this one guy, I respected him cause I was like, this guy, clearly this is, this is a joke to him as well, cause his surname was Mo, Mo Money. <laughs> No, 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 what you're missing is in Cantonese, not so good as in more money. In English, very good, more money, right? So I was like, wow, that is so cool. I told him, like, is that why you call yourself money? He's like, no, I'm like, damn, he got lucky. I thought he was like, you're a genius, but no. Now, reverse, I can say, oh my god, I met this guy, and his name was so, so dumb. His name was money, right? And his surname was Mo, but he has no money. <laughs> if I said it that way, now it's kind of, again, offensive, right? I'm kind of like joking, mocking him. But reverse it, when I package it in a way where I'm like, oh, that's so impressive, that's so cool, suddenly the glow is lessened, which is another technique in comedy that allows us to talk about things you don't want to talk about. It allows us to talk about issues that we're kind of like, ooh, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm, let's just ignore that. So again, without my realizing it, over time, by doing stand-up comedy, I was talking about issues that people kind of wanted to talk about, but never found a way to discuss. Like I said, the police car, I mean the ID car kind of issue, which has actually become a point that I go to schools and the teachers that invite me and want to talk to me about it, like, really, is that what happens? You know, how many times per week? I'm telling them, what, what's going on? And over time, I was like, wait a second, a lot of my stories actually have social issues behind them, which, are, which now I can bring out and talk about. So another thing is that I really get annoyed, oh, this really annoys me, that like, when people say to me, hey, Viv, you're Indian, do you do yoga, all right? I want to clarify something. No one was born like that, all right? <laughs> no one's born that way. However, one day I did decide, I'm going to learn some yoga. You know what, like, it's my culture, I should learn this kind of stuff. So I decided to go to yoga class, right? which is super awkward, because here I am, this Indian guy, going to a yoga class in Hong Kong. Okay, so I go sign up and everything, they give me a yoga mat, I take my mat, and I walk into the little classroom. He was like, classroom number three, my sweet, okay. So I go there with my yoga mat, I open the door, the other classmates, the other students are already there waiting for the teacher. Of course, I open the door, everyone sees me like, <gasps> the master has arrived. <laughs> right? I immediately move up, like, nope, not happening, get out, get out, get out, get out, right? And it's weird because I was like, really? I can't even learn my own culture? This is insane, right? The other thing that happened to me is that, you know, I, I get uh, casted for different roles on TV sometimes, and typecasting fully exists, right? However, I used to joke about how, like, hey, I have monopoly over every terrorist role, ha, ha, ha. However, I kind of decided, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of being the bad guy, you know? Every single time, it's always terrorist, thief, technician, stuff. I'm like, I'm done, man. I want, like, you know, if I'm going to act, I want to do, like, a proper role that, you know, kind of identifies with who I am. So one day, my friend calls me up, hey, Viv, we got a role just for you. I'm like, look, I'm gonna make a fit for I don't wanna die at the end. I don't wanna blow up, okay? He's like, no, 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 you won't die. I'm like, really? I won't die at the end? Like, yes, I'll be there. So he tells me, come down to Chip Set Choi. There's a bar, they're filming over there. Just come on down, and I'll tell you all about it. Okay, no problem. So I go down there. I'm excited, I'm like, a bar? I'm a bartender? And, you know, am I the bouncer? You know, am I, am I the boyfriend? Let her be, come on, let her be, let her be, right? My friend comes up, hey Viv, uh, yeah, your role today, you're gonna be the pervert at the bar, the hot stuff guy. <laughs> I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, Viv, just for you. When I wrote it, I was like, Viv, he can do this role. I'm like, ah, uh, right? I was there already, I'm like, whatever, let's do this, okay? So this is the scene, this is a real scene, and it's actually a show on RTHK called Seng Bunsi, which is like about sex education, something like that, right? Of course, trying to get this guy, right? So uh, the scene is very simple. So there's a lady standing at the bar waiting for a friend, and I have to walk up to her, like a creepy guy, right? I have to be like, hey, baby. What's your name? Let me buy you a drink. And she will simply say, No! And that's it. One line, right? And I, when I read that, I was like, I was feeling pretty confident. I'm like, you know what? I think I can do this in one take. I've been practicing this line for 35 years of my life. I'm ready to go, right? The director then says, Oh, V, by the way, um, remember, you're, you're the pervert at the bar. I'm like, I, I know. Dude. I want you to walk like a pervert. Okay, I want you to talk like a pervert. Like, already do that, okay? I want you to breathe like a pervert. I'm like, how do you want me to breathe like a pervert? The director then says, for you, just breathe normally. <laughs> hey? So I was like, whatever, I'm a professional, let's do this. So I get in position, the girl's at the bar waiting for a friend, 
And that's when I'm like, she's like, action! I'm like, hey, baby, what's your name? Let me buy you a drink. <laughs> right? And the girl, she's like, no! And the director's like, cut! And I'm like, oh, oh, did I do something wrong? I think I was really perverted. Like, what's going on? But like, the director asked me, how come when she said no, my face had no reaction? And I was like, you're right, because getting rejected by women is so normal to me. Right? <laughs> and she was like, okay, get me a beer. I'm like, really? Already? So fast? Really? Are you sure? Is the light on? Like, what's going on, right? So it's another issue. I was like, I was like, wait a second, that's really interesting. Because like I kind of looked at it as a funny little angle of like, oh really? You got the typical, of course, I'm the one who gets subjected, stuff like that. But I kind of joke about that. I kind of think it's, it's hilarious. I'm like, really? Like, you, you always reject me? This is how it's going to work? But other people don't think so, right? Now, lucky for me, I have an outlet to talk about these stories. I have an outlet to talk about all these bizarre, silly, weird things I get to deal with every day. However, other people don't, so it annoys them. I've had so many situations where every, when I think about it, I would be like, this is not right, but this is so funny, right? Even like, I'll give, give you a prime example. We have so many habits on a daily basis that we actually do without realizing as if this is really weird. Why do we do this? So let, we've all taken the train, right? We've all taken the train, I'm sure. So I'll give you a prime example, right? When we take the train, let's say we see the, we see the, the row of empty seats, right? Do we find those seats to be equal? No, right? What do we all do? The first choice is the side two seats, right? Because in Hong Kong, we don't like the idea of having human beings on my right and my left shoulder, right? I'd rather have a plastic board because a human being has the risk of falling asleep, right? If he or she falls asleep on my shoulder, I have the annoying job of like, what do I do now, right? So we go to the sides. Even if someone's butt is squished against the board, you're like, you know what, it's warm, I don't care, it's fine, right? We'll do that. And we all do that without realizing it. Now let's say the side two seats are taken, right? What's the second choice? Now for some trains, there's only four, seven, and five. The ones with the six seats, there's a pole in the middle, correct? And that's our second choice, obviously, because the pole is a symbol of, I don't know you, you don't know me. It's not cross the line, right? That kind of thing. Now, third choice. People, the two seats in the middle are taken, two seats on the side are taken. There's still two empty seats. How do we decide on these seats? Do we just sit? No. We look at who's sitting next to those seats, right? Is he or she looking sleepy? Is he or she overweight? If that is the case, I will not risk it. I would rather stand. And God forbid that seat is one of those you know, priority seats with the red stickers on it. We're like, oh God, no. No, I'm not touching that seat at all, right? And these are the habits we do without realizing it. But as a comedian, my job is to catch these small nuances that we actually do on a daily basis. And kind of like, oh, you're right. Like even the way we take the lift, I always joke about how like, people tell me about the Hong Kong identity. And I say, look, I need to see from the way you take a lift, how long you've been in Hong Kong. A foreigner or a tourist or whatever comes to Hong Kong, comes to the lift, presses the fifth floor button, and just waits, right? Okay, the door will close eventually. <laughs> Not a local, very easily, right? Someone comes in, presses the fifth floor button, and presses the door close button. Okay, they've been in Hong Kong for maybe like at least a week to a month, right? But the moment you've lived in Hong Kong for more than, let's say, two months, three months, you know the rule is press the fifth floor button and just go nuts on the door close button. Like, oh God, don't you dare open it again, right? <laughs> again, it's all these silly, silly little habits that I can mention, but when you really think about it, isn't it really tragic that we are always rushing here? That we are always kind of like, oh, come on, just close the door, always, no, no, no. Why is it that we're always at the last minute? Why is it that we want to make sure that we're the last guy on the minibus? Because every minute counts here, right? The reason we're so happy that we get on the minibus just right is that we did not waste time, right? We got there just in time. You like the feeling of like the train doors closing, you see the little guy, you're like, huh, yes, right? We do that, why? doesn't make sense, right? Another prime example, actually, there's so many things we do all the time that we don't realize. Only when you talk about it in a funny way would you be willing to listen. Like, if I just told you, did you know that when we take the MTR, you know, we're always in a rush, we don't like running, da 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 You're like, this is, why are you telling me this? What's the point? But the moment I package it in a joke, you're like, oh, you're right, yeah, he's right, right. Prime example, MTR, another prime example, okay? Uh, have, has anybody taken the train to North Point Station and changed trains to go to the Gangland Line, you know, that one? So it's very simple, right? One side train, the other side train, it's a one minute platform, all right? 
That one minute platform is when you can see the true psychology behind every person that takes the train. There's always this, you're on North Point side, right? The train doors are still closed, but you see the opposite train, the doors are open. And that's when you talk to you, you're like, okay, all right, what is my strategy? All right, so do I want to look good or do I want to get the train, <laughs> right? If you want to look good, you'll be like, ba -da -ba 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 -da -ba -ba, so much time, so much, why do we do that? But if you want to get the train, you're like, ah! However, we're very greedy. We want the best of both worlds, right? So you don't only just want to look good, but we want to get the train. But we cannot run, because if you run, you don't look good, you lose space. But if you, if you walk slowly, you're going to miss the train. So what do we all do? We just walk really fast. Like, what? I'm not running. I, I walk like this. This is how I am, right? And we all do like the Grand Prix, and kind of slip streaming, and stuff like zzz, that kind of stuff. So this is what happens. Is when you're walking, you're always, everyone's thinking, we're all like, please, come on, get out, come on, come on, don't miss it, come on. But you don't want to, oh, I don't want to do it. Oh, you know, it's just cool. Don't think it's, it's cool, it's cool, right? And there's always that one guy you see running, and you're like, <laughs> lose it, right? But you kind of judge, like, oh, but he's going to get the train, oh, I don't know, right? But you also see that one guy in front of you who's walking slowly, you're like, oh, this idiot, why are you walking so slowly? What's wrong with you, right? Because in Hong Kong, we don't say stuff like, excuse me. Excuse me, help me, excuse me. That. We don't do it, we just, like, we just stare at them like, oh, I don't like you at all, right? So we do. All right, so we're walking to get to the other train. We're walking really fast. We're all hoping let's get on that train. Now, you're almost there, but you hear the do 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 sound, and what do we all do? We say, does it matter? I don't care. Forget my face. Forget all that stuff. I don't want to look good. I want to get the train. And we start running like, ah, I run, right? Now, let me tell you this. You run, you get on the train, you're like, yes. But the worst feeling in the world is after you ran, the train doors don't close. Right? You ran, you turn around, no, no, close the door, what's wrong, right? So you're looking at the doors, the doors are still open, people are running, you're like, no, it's not right, I ran, what's going on? The worst feeling is not even you running and getting on the train and the doors don't close. The worst feeling is that one guy who's like, ba -da -ba 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 -da, so much time. And you're like, no, you cannot get on. This is not right. No, no, right? So think about it. What I just did over there was literally talk about things that we do on a daily basis, but maybe not realize it because it's so normal. That's what we do, right? In the same way, a lot of taboo topics, we may do it without realizing it. Just like that old guy called me a quiet old, he never realized that, wait a second, you're right, I must discriminate him correctly. Never thought of that, right? Just like that policeman just was like, oh, M, whatever, Mohammed, who cares, right? He never realized, wait a second, this is very insulting. It's like, you know, imagine I call him, let's say, a Mr. Wong or Mr. Wang. It's like it's a very different name. Right? But to me, it's like, it's the same thing, Wong Wang, the same thing, right? But that's my point, is that with comedy, we are forced to look at things from so many angles and hopefully find that interesting angle and then use a way, wrap it around with some kind of humor and tell it to you so you kind of want to listen to what we have to say and at the same time find it interesting enough to self-reflect, which is the third part of comedy. The best comedy is the ones where it makes you laugh and makes you self-reflect. Makes you kind of like, oh, you're right, actually. I guarantee the next time you take the minibus and you realize, oh, one, two, three, oh, I am counting, right? The next time you take a lift and you go press the door close, you're like, oh, he's right, I do do that, right? It makes you self-reflect. So a lot of times, I'm, without my realizing it, my comedy makes certain people be like, huh, this is an issue. But it does get awkward because sometimes people take it too seriously. I've been invited to many, many different events where they're like, okay, Viv, I want you to go up there and tell us your funniest jokes and open our minds. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't make my jokes like this big educational thing. Just, just have fun time. You know, you open your mind up to you, right? But the point I don't really, what I, sorry, what I never realized is that the potential behind these stories is that it kind of instills a seed in your head. It makes you go like, huh, this is very interesting. Or you may also encounter something of the same parallel. So for example, uh, my joke about the ID card thing, what I've never realized is that when I go to let's say, schools to talk about my times, many students suddenly feel a certain relief to realize I'm not the only one. They're like, oh, he gets in trouble too. Okay, this is all right, right? Many people kind of like, oh, this is actually an issue not just amongst a small group. This is happening all over the place. At the same time, like the fact that I don't speak my own language, many people were like embarrassed by it, but now they're like, oh, this is actually a common thing. So I've met so many uh, fellow Indians as well who are young kids, let's say teenagers, and they speak. Hindi or Urdu or whatever, and they speak Cantonese, but they don't speak English. I'm like, that is mind blowing. So can you imagine myself with another Indian person in Hong Kong? We can only communicate in Cantonese. Do you understand the, the craziest part? It's not even us, it's the people around us who are like, how come I understand them? Is my 
Do I speak Indian languages? What's going on? Right? That's the thing. Many times when I meet people and I speak to them in Cantonese, there's a there's this double take in people's heads where they're like, wait, oh, huh? What, what did you just say? I'm like, oh, it's gone. Oh my God, oh, huh? And what's weird is people actually have a have a, a, a struggle responding to me in Cantonese. Many people still reply me in English. And I'm like, why? They're like, my brain just won't allow it. I, I look at you and I'm like, I, I can't speak Cantonese. This doesn't make sense. I'm like, why? This is just a weird thing. Like, but I don't know. This doesn't. It doesn't. You're you're moving your mouth, but you're dubbing the words. It doesn't make sense to me, right? But there's so many of these situations I joke about. And ultimately, the point is that in my comedy is that I'm not trying to like make a big change. I'm not trying to say you're wrong, I'm right. But the idea is that it's how you perceive things. So for me, as a comedian, when things happen to me outside on the streets, when someone insults me or whatever, I find it funny. And I will maybe put it together and make a joke out of it, right? But the next guy doesn't have that outlet. He may not have the chance to say something. He may not have the interest to make it a funny joke. He might kind of like, he just called me quite a while. What did I do? I just walked on the streets and he was already angry at me. However, for me, I've had so many situations where people think I don't speak Cantonese and say stuff to me in Cantonese that it now has become a common game for me. Where I walk out and I'm like, what am I gonna hear today? Who's gonna say something to me? Oh, this is gonna be good. Who, what, wait, did you tell me? No, okay. Who, you insulted me? No, okay, right, that kind of thing. And I'll give you one story that really happened to me. So, uh, many years ago, my uncle, who's at home, he said, hey babe, uh, are you free today? And I was like, yeah, what's up? He's like, hey, I have this box, can you deliver it to your cousin in Shinsai Shoi? And I was like, can't you just mail it to him? If I mail it, I gotta pay for it. Like, yeah, if I travel, I gotta pay for it. Yeah, you gotta pay for it. <laughs> Fine, whatever, right? I'm a good kid, okay. So it's this box, it's like 6.30 p.m. I'm at Admiralty Station. Worst time ever. Rush hour, big mistake. So I'm with my box, okay? With my box, lining up with everybody else. And we're all at the train, waiting for the train to arrive. And I'm over there with the box, okay? So wait, train arrives, everyone's like, oh, I just charging into the train. That's cool. Now, I, I'm going and going, and I see, hey, this is space, I can get in, I can get in. But I knew I have to get off at the next station, right? So I decided, let me think long term, let me go in backwards. And I was like, okay, let me get on the train like that, right? So I go a little backwards, I'm like, okay, I'm on the train, this is cool, okay, I'm there, I'm there, right? Everyone else on the platform is all looking at me. Now, what I find is very interesting in Hong Kong is that we are so efficient, we are so rushed all the time, that we even minimize the amount of words we speak. So for example, when I was growing up, I would speak English and Cantonese, right? But what I'm realizing is that the more Cantonese I learned, the less English I was using on a daily basis, because I felt Cantonese was so much more efficient. So I would no longer say things such as, you know, I'm sorry, excuse me, Please, I would never say that anymore in English because my mouth will automatically translate into Cantonese and just save time, right? So let's say I bump into somebody like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir, my apologies, have a lovely day. I want to say that. My brain is thinking that, but my mouth will automatically translate it and make it efficient. So I'm thinking, I'm so sorry, my apologies, have a lovely day. But my mouth will simply just say, <laughs> right? You get the point. <laughs> Which is why when my friends come to Hong Kong, I immediately brief them like, oh, uh, by the way, uh, means thank you. <laughs> and suddenly now Hong Kong is the most polite place in the world. They're like, wow, people so nice. They took me all day. I'm like, yeah, man. So, yeah. so I'm there with my box on a train, right? And no one else can get on. And I'm over there looking at people on the platform. And no one says anything. But I can see their eyes. Like, right? But you can hear, you can hear a whole sea of echoes of, right? And I'm like, whatever, dude, I'm sorry, dude, I, no space, you know, no my problem. Then suddenly this really short gentleman walks up, cuts the line, everything, he walks up, he looks at me, he sees, looks down, he's like, there's a little space, he's like, yeah. And I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, 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 doesn't get it, right? And he's just like, he's like, <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing, pumping the air out so you're thinner? How does this, this is not physics, right? He's like, <laughs> He just charges in, boom, back in, you know, whoa, he gets in. And he squeezes in, I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe he did it, but he's in, he's in, whatever, just close the door, let's go, let's go. The door's closed, right? Now, we all know, you know, when you're on the MTR, somehow we're like human Tetris, we just fit everything. We're like, okay, I'm good, no, don't move, just don't move, just don't breathe, don't move, and we're fine. So, Admiralty to Tim Sashoy is one full minute, all right? It's a full minute journey, and that is when this gentleman decides, you know what, he has nothing better to do. Let me yell at this guy with the box, right? So, here I am. He's looking at me, I'm looking at him. He's like, You will catch your bomb on the game, I'm like, I have joined the side, I'm going to hell to the 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 h
But because it's so squishy, it's like, oh gosh, it's not the same. I'm like, oh, it's just sitting like Right? He's talking, I'm like, look, maybe he's having a bad day. It's cool, I don't mind. Right? He's talking, I'm like, however, remember, this is one full minute. A whole minute, which is actually quite tough, because by 30 seconds, this guy ran out of vocabulary. <laughs> he's like, it's okay, it's okay. Right? He, he said everything. He's like, you know, go to India, come back, go back again. He's like, you know, why are you here? Why are you so hairy? What's with the boss? You know, why are you da, da, da. Right? And at that point, I was like feeling awkward because we're looking at each other, super romantic, but it's super awkward. Like, I don't want to look at this guy. And in Chinese, we have this term called dead air, right? And when you have dead air, it's like, oh, I, I, this is awkward, right? It's really awkward and stuff. I thought, you know what? Let me save the day. You know, I'll just break the silence. So I'm with my boss, this guy look at me, I'm looking at him, everyone's still talking, they're ignoring us. And that's when I simply said, Abba, <laughs> which means, sir, I speak Cantonese, you know. And the best thing was him immediately looking at me like, huh? <laughs> Basically he's like, why would you say so? I'm like, what? I don't want to I don't want to interrupt you, I'm polite guy, you finish what you have to say. But that wasn't even the best thing. The best thing was his reaction and then the people around us all went silent. <laughs> all you can hear are people stand there and it's all going <laughs> all right? So there you go, like that, that could have been a really, really bad situation, but for me, I was like dying, oh my god, this is so good, I wanna write this down, this is hilarious, right? So again, an insult to a different person can have a different re re reaction. For me, as a comedian, I'm able to channel these things and kind of twist it around and tell it back to you in a funny way. I could do the same joke, same story, in a very upset, angry, straight, informative way. So for example, I could say, today I took the MTR and it was just so crammed in. I had this boss already, but no one was going to help me. And when the train arrived, everyone just pushed me. And I was like, oh my god, just calm down, man. This is every two minutes. I got on the train, I thought, you know what, maybe it's easier this way if I just go backwards, right? I just won't bother people. So I went backwards onto the train, and I'm already like trying to squeeze in as much as I can, not to waste the space and everything, and everyone around me is just angry. I can hear people around me like, ugh, ugh. And I was like, what? Look, I'm not trying to, do, I'm trying to squeeze as much as I can, okay? Come on, guys. And suddenly this guy just comes up, he sees me, takes a deep breath, and just bangs into me. I'm like, wow, are you crazy? Come on, why are you so impatient? Come on, just take the next train. Now, when the train starts, this guy's looking at me, he's just angry, yelling at me, the derogatory terms in Cantonese, just yelling, 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 and I was getting upset. I was like, oh, this is not right, I'm gonna say something, right? Or halfway through the journey, I said, I'm done, I'm tired of hearing it. I said, Appa, I'll say to my right? And he immediately was like scared, he's like, now he knows what I said, I can't go anywhere, right? And I was like, oh, you're in trouble now. But everyone around me never helped me. They just suddenly went silent, nobody said anything. They're just like, <laughs> that's so silly, right? Now, look at it. The same story, when I said it in a more angry way, you kind of find it funny-ish, kind of like you're looking at it from a third person point of view, but someone could have perceived the whole situation like that. Where they were like, nobody helped me, people were pushing me around, I could hear people you know, upset around me, doing it all over the place. And even when that guy did that, nobody came to defend me. Even when I said something in Cantonese, everyone just laughed at me, right? So think about it. While the first story was me going like, this is so funny, this is hilarious, I love the fact that this is happening, right? The second story is like, I, this is a horrible place, I hate this place, you know, everyone's, you know, a racist stuff. So again, same situation is how you perceive it, but like I said, comedy's objective is to package it, make you laugh about it. Not make you go like, that's not right, that's not right, but just laugh about it, but without you realizing it, is that you will subconsciously kind of have a, have a judgment about it. You'll be like, huh, this situation is it's not the best situation, you know, I, I have a certain opinion about it. So that's the whole point of comedy is that I'm able to channel things package it and retell it to you so you can self-reflect and kind of be like, hmm, would I do that? How would I respond to that, right? Some people would not even say anything. I would like to say something because I just want to see the reaction, but other people would just be upset, like, I'm not going to talk to him. Some people just wouldn't even let him talk, just insult him, right? You know, start fighting, right? So that's my point, right? So I want to tell you that the whole story about the comedy and everything, the key has never been, I want to save the world, I want to change the world, it was never that. But it's a byproduct, much like Someone who likes cooking healthy food opens up a restaurant, right? And the food is really tasty. People come to eat at the restaurant. A byproduct of that is that the people around who came to the restaurant now get healthier, right? That was never the objective. He or she simply wanted to cook tasty food, and over time, it became 
it was healthy food, and people ate more of it, and they enjoyed a better life. That sort of thing, right? Same with colony. It was never about trying to change the world without realizing it, because like, the way you say things, the, the topics you talk about, makes people self-reflect, and hopefully will then have an impact where people are like, hmm, if I were that guy, I would not do it this way. Or the next time you take a lift, you might say, my friend's running, it's cool, door open. Shocking, oh, door, open. of course. But uh, let me warn you though, if you decide to be the great Samaritan, and is in the lift, and you decide, I'm gonna press the door open button, your friend will be happy, but everyone else in the lift, they'll be like, they'll be very upset, they're like, why are you doing this? I am in a rush, all right? So that, that's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna uh, uh, hand it back to you. We have a lot of Q&A now. I know most of the times when it comes to anybody have questions, we all kind of like, I know, it's big, can we go now, right? If you do have a question, but you're too embarrassed to ask about it, or you're too scared, the trick is, uh, yeah, my friend wants to know. <laughs> Just ask the question, all right? All right, cool. Thank you guys for having me. It was a real pleasure. I enjoyed talking to you guys, so have a long well evening. Thank you. and then hopefully I will encourage you to ask yours. Um, the first question I have is um, the question of language. I mean, you are a wordsmith, right? And I think that's a gift, and not everybody has this gift. Um, but you mentioned the word um, yourself, and also because we have a lot of students, and I, I hear it like every year, the question of actually how to call ethnic minorities in Hong Kong. There is an organization here, it's called Zubin Foundation, and 2014, you this report as well, they um, had a report on the so-called ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, right? And they use the word ethnic minority, but also question it because they said it's actually a term that people find problematic. Um, and um, so the question is, I find it also problematic, also because actually people talk about Pakistanis and Indian and Nepali and you know others um, here in Hong Kong. So what would your response be to that? Uh, I'm, I'm saying with Student Foundation. So the term ethnic minority, like when I was growing up in let's say primary school, there was no such term yet. There was no category of like ethnic minorities. It was just Indians and Pakistanis and stuff like that. Now, it was mostly after the handover that they started having this term for a lot of reasons, but I never identified that as me. I was never like, I'm an ethnic minority, I'm a, I'm a Hong Konger, this is my home. This is my life, this is where I call home, and this is the, the life that I live. So I always say like, when I was growing up, it was always a classmate, neighbor, friend. It was never ethnic minority classmate. Oh, this is my ethnic minority neighbor. There was no categorizing. Because if, if we're ethnic minority, then you're all ethnic majority. I could be like, this is ethnic majority student, ethnic majority student, ethnic majority student, right? It doesn't make sense. I don't identify with that term. I find that term also derogatory in a way because it doesn't fully represent the, the, the so-called minorities in Hong Kong. So when you think of ethnic minority, very likely you would think of, let's say, tan skin, brown skin person. Very rarely would someone say, oh, look at my friend, you know, this British friend of mine who's, let's say, happens to be white. He's an ethnic minority. No one thinks that, right? Why? They are just as minority as we are. So that's the issue we've always had. And what's happening with Zuma Foundation is that on September 20th, I'm part of this play that we're doing, and that Carrie Lamb is going to be over there watching, is that we're trying to promote the idea of let's be done with ethnic minority. We are all Hong Kongers. Because the new generation of kids are having this identity crisis where, am I a Hong Konger? I'm third generation here in Hong Kong. I'm as, I'm, I'm highly like more Hong Konger than the next guy as well, right? And this is my home. When I go travel to do shows, I tell the organizer, make sure you tell people from Hong Kong, not from India, not from China, from Hong Kong. That's how I identify with it. I'm not trying to find like, I'm not from China or whatever. I'm saying Hong Kong is my home. That's how I identify. You introduce me like that. So yeah, I'm a Hong Kong and I don't identify with anything like that term. Yeah. Okay. So because we have this discussion every year and I think that it might be useful for you guys because many of you, um, your media workers and you will do surveys also and research projects, I know. And every year you come up across the, the same question, who or what is a Hong Konger? And usually you have a very clear idea, I think, from my experience, who, who is a Hong Konger. So thanks for clarifying that. Also, the second one, and then I will definitely, yeah, Vivian's yeah. one. Um, the question, because so many media workers are here, and um, I have grown up in a place that was very white, um, in the eastern part of Germany, where there are a lot of problems right now, if you will not go away, um, with people and yet the question of difference and diversity. 
Um, and also for me, it took a long time to learn the language and have role models that showed me actually how to talk about diversity. So what would you say to people here in the room? Um, how can we do something in Hong Kong about increasing this diversity in the media, in, in education, and many other parts? I think like the, the two ways to look at it. So we use Singapore as a good example. So in Singapore, they, they constantly try to remind that we're all Singaporeans. They, they make it a point that, you know, that, that neighbor of yours, she's a Singaporean or she's a Singaporean. In Hong Kong, it's always never been like we're all Hong Kongers and one big happy family. It's always been like, oh, you are a non-Chinese person at best. Uh, what's happened is that the newspaper, the media also has uh, fault at this because when they report certain issues, it's always like, let's say, like I said, a, a, a typical Caucasian guy does something, it's always like you have to see, right? A foreign, you know, nationality person. Whereas, let's say, a, a guy like myself does it, it's not my yoy, right? South Asian. Why? Why am I suddenly South Asian? I'm also foreign nationality, like, it doesn't make sense. But it's just easier, because we all know what we're talking about. When we say always like that, see, we kind of know what we mean. So everyone assumes, like, look, I'm doing it for convenience, okay? We get what we mean. That's my point. The issue is that just because it's convenient doesn't mean it's right. Just like saying, you know, call me Asha as fast as that Mabubani gonna make a show, right? It doesn't make it right. So what can be done is that basically you could say, act like maybe follow these states where it's like, you know, Asian American, or let's say Indian Hong Kong at best, I guess. But I still say Hong Kong's not a race, it's not an ethnic like ethnicity, it's more a mindset. It's more like a lifestyle as well. Like someone who lives in Hong Kong and knows the game of like stand on the right, walk on the left on the escalator, is a Hong Konger. The guy who happens to be Chinese but stand on the left is not embracing the Hong Kong spirit, in my opinion, right? So I would say the best thing you could do is actually just say, like I say, I'm a Hong Konger of Indian heritage. I, I, I can identify like that. So I would encourage you guys as well that if you were to identify someone, really get to know who they are, because a lot of times there's this term called third culture kid. Basically means that this person grew up in a culture that's not their own or their parents, and so they identify with that culture. Which is funny because I have so many friends who are let's say American born Chinese, and they come to Hong Kong, and time after time I always take them to a Chinese restaurant, and I just sit back and laugh, right? So the waiters will walk by, they'll ignore me, they'll talk to my friends, my friends are like, I don't know what you just did, and I would translate, and the waiter's like, wow, let's go to one, and it's the best thing ever, right? <laughs> So yeah, I identify as a Hong Konger, and I, will, and I think there's more and more people. I have met too many youngsters now who say I'm a Hong Konger, and not I'm a Filipino, or I'm an Indian. I'm a Hong Kong, Hong Kong is my home. To the point that they would rather be in Hong Kong to celebrate their birthday than to, let's say, go to India or go to anywhere else to celebrate, because they're like, I like Hong Kong, same for me. I would look forward to coming back to Hong Kong. So now I think I want to open it up before I talk too much. Um, questions? We got some hands up there as well. I think I should let them. Okay, all right, cool, yeah, yeah. In the back? Yeah, sure. Would you be loud enough or you want to? Oh, we oh, yeah, have a mic as well, sweet. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for such a lovely time. That was, you're hilarious. Um, but. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the good things about that, good <laughs> um, So. I guess for me, wit in the English language and wit in Cantonese are very different. And my question to you is, how would you say those two kinds of wit have like influenced your style of humor? Okay, so the different languages definitely. I mean, what's what you find is that when I do a show, so like last night actually I did like one English show followed by a Cantonese. We we have this laugh that's still going on now, which just started. So I had my shows last night, which was a lot of fun because like you do a show in English and you switch your brain go to Cantonese and. Because I grew up speaking English at home and Cantonese at school, I'm able to think in Cantonese as well. So I get that easier flow. However, what I find is that it's not so much the language that has the issue, it's the nuances of the way you, you deliver the story. So for example, in Cantonese, when I talk about a story, I try not to pinpoint anyone and say, oh, you do this or you do that way. Because it's kind of like, oh, he's not talking about me, he's talking about that guy, you know, not me, I'm okay. So in the Cantonese language, I used to have to be more visual in my storytelling. Because a lot of times in Chinese, when we talk to each other, we get to the point, like ABC, just do that, and just, just walk, don't ask so much, just do it. But in comedy, I have to help you draw the picture in your head. So I have to do the extra step of like, I'm in the cha cha head and do like four seats and stuff. In English, I might say, I'm in a restaurant. But in Chinese, I'll say, I'm in a cha cha you know, say, you go, I'm in a But in English, I'll say, I went to a restaurant, I sat down. 
So I gotta help you draw the picture a bit more in Cantonese, which is what I find. However, I like the Cantonese language because the way you say a certain word can provoke a different emotion behind it. I mean, English has that a little bit. Cantonese is just something about it that the way you just say like, you know, it's very different like, you know, that kind of thing, right? So all these kind of small nuances, because I grew up here and I spoke the language like anyone on the streets, I, I picked up all, all those small, small nuances and without realizing it, when I talk to people, I automatically do that. So it's like, uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of these jokes where I just say, like, okay, so uh, I have this joke about swearing in Cantonese that I say, when you swear in Cantonese, it's very different from English, because like in English, you know, it's like you watch TV, whatever, school. But in Cantonese, like the, the, the way you say it, so I'm gonna replace the word that I wanna use with another word, so that's just because, you know, academic. So, so I'm gonna say like, boo, right? So we all, if the letter is the letter D word. Can I, can I swear? Okay, so the word is boo, right? We all know the word, right? <laughs> I was like, it won't work if I do boo. So in Cantonese, let's say, right, we're with a bunch of friends, and someone's late. And when they arrive, we automatically, we don't just go to we go like yeah. Right? You gotta feel the frustration in the, in the words. But also, that's a signal of how well our relationship is. Like, if you're on the streets and you bump into a stranger, right, he won't be like he'll be like really fast, right? So the length of how you people, right, helps you. So these small, like, like in English, you're like, ah, fuck, that kind of thing, right? But in Chinese, the, the thing has a very significant uh, meaning behind it. You get my point? So it's like, all these small, small nuances, like, I play with it. But what I find is that when I have to do a joke in Chinese, and I write a lot of jokes nowadays that both work in both languages, but I go to visually draw it more out in Cantonese, just because the language is not used to it. Yeah, that's what I find the biggest difference. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? And you speak so fast. Oh yeah, I get excited, sorry. I'm like, oh my god, that's so fun. No, it's, it's yeah, very, yeah. I kind of admire that speed. Yeah, yeah we're media workers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I totally understand the problem with media now because you know there are some forces that want to shape the agenda setting of Nam Na Yoi, okay? Every day on certain paper. Now, now you know, it's the problem of something. So there is structural reason behind why somebody wants to put now now you know, escape or goes. But I I think I'm also not comfortable with the uh, the idea that okay let's just treat everyone as Hong Kong because we would you definitely understand is there is a bunch of uh, kids that really have problem of Chinese education and exam and our school, like, like I mean the university, like admits only ESE of certain level. And okay, so everybody's Hong Konger, so you have to just write the exams like everybody else and totally you know what I'm talking about. So there are some media workers with some uh, um, uh, advocate uh, people, like activists who try to at least you know group this the, the, the needs of the, the kids that, okay, maybe for certain um, applications and uh, jobs in the government, that, like in the um, police or immigration, you know what I'm talking about. So we at least have to draw the attention of the mainstream, to the mainstream that these kids, they cannot write exams in Chinese like everybody else of a Chinese descent. So, so you're kind of putting a label to this group to attend to their need. So if I just, okay, brush the need of everyone, like everybody's Hong Kong, okay, let's just write the exam, like, so, so I think um, you got my point. No, it's a very valid point. I think like, there's a reason they categorize this group just for a lot of like, administrative work, and just to know that, okay, we're, we're just labeling you so we know that we have to attend to you and provide these certain extra services. And it's also drawing the attention of the mainstream, like, yeah, yeah. like everybody, okay, you're Hong Kong, you say you're Hong Kong, just write the exam like everybody else. Yeah. I fully understand that. I mean, I, when you talk from a labeling point of view, just for the purposes of like, we have to give them extra, let's say, attention or like, to, uh, because of yeah, support. So let me use myself as an example. So my parents don't speak Cantonese. And my learning Cantonese was extremely difficult. And how it worked out was not that, oh, this guy's so smart, is that my parents made it a point. This is not an option. Learning Cantonese is not an option. One way or another, we have to do it. That was their top priority. They put me in a local Chinese school not because it was a common thing. Back in the 1980s, it was not the common thing to do. It was more international schools and stuff like that. Back in the 19, uh, 1980s and 1990s, 
the quote unquote ethnic minorities in Hong Kong were better off. They had more money, which is why you would see there's a group of non Chinese people who live prosperously. You go to the peak, you're like, I don't see many Chinese people suddenly now, right? You go to the mid levels, you got a mixture of people. So, how come there's an ethnic minority issue when I look around the world and like, these guys seem fine? Like, I go to, I go to let's say, I go to a bank or an investment bank or a company, everything seems okay, right? So what's happened is that is the government or the local school system that is having a problem because when I was growing up, schools would treat me like any other kid. It was my parents' responsibility to make sure I got enough support or uh, after school support to learn my Cantonese. That was my parents' thinking. That was, I'm not saying that that's what everyone thinks. So my parents made it a point that like, we're not gonna blame the system. We're not gonna expect the system to give us extra support. It's our responsibility because we as parents don't speak Cantonese to figure out a way that our son can learn Cantonese on top of whatever else, everything else, uh, whatever other stuff he like uh, learning in school. So after school, I would have to, uh, tutorial classes. In primary three to primary six, every day after school, I had to go to the tutorial centers. Three hours a day, it was horrible. However, that was what my parents believed would work, and over time, they saw the results. So in primary two, I came second last in Cantonese, in the whole school. My parents were worried, my mom was crying, I remember that day, but she knew, she was like, I, this is not an option. We told ourselves, he has to learn Cantonese one way or another, whatever it takes. So the reason we did not even speak uh, Hindi at home was my parents were very worried I would not speak English. So they said English only at home. School is Cantonese. So the moment we left the door, they wanted to make sure I'm learning Cantonese in a way. So that was their idea. I was lucky that they could afford tutorial centers, which is exactly my point, which is what uh, the problem is. It's the families who don't have that funding or that money or cannot afford it, or don't the even- will, The will be you to act like your parents. Exactly, exactly, which is what happens. So what I find is that when I go to a lot of schools to give talks, especially if I go to let's say teach so white, or you know, a certain story, stuff like that, a lot of the families are more traditional minded. The problem is that because they're still using a very traditional mind, they're still thinking, no, my child will get to this age, get married, have a family, which is fine. However, I always say you have to learn to evolve with the world. Like, I'm a big believer in Bruce Lee's line of be water, my friend. You gotta shape yourself and change yourself and evolve yourself based on the situation you're in. So what happens is that if you're still stuck in the old traditional life, kid who will get married, you will not care about the education. You say, I just gotta get through school because it's legal. I mean, you have to do it. And then, whatever, we'll deal with it when it happens. At the same time, many parents don't think so far ahead. Now, when my kid grows up, what will he or she do? So that's the issue is that many parents don't take that extra step, but at the same time, we cannot expect that every parent to be so uh, far-sighted. So the issue is that the government, well, I shouldn't say the government should, but the government could basically work out a system that they have like can Chinese, uh, lower level Chinese for let's say ethnic minority, right? But let's be very honest, this is rubbish. When they finish that studies, it's no use. They give the paper that says A, but you go get a job that like you can't speak Chinese, which is basically lying to yourself, which is another issue that I'm, I'm very much against. Giving me a letter, giving me a sheet of paper, just give me a letter a, with a letter A to say, okay, you well done, is useless because in the real world, no one's gonna hire you. And all that matters is, is the authenticity of whether you can get a job, right? So I fully understand what your point about the ethnic minority grouping thing. I find it's the identity crisis everyone's having now. When I talk to y'all youngsters that they identify as a Hong Konger but they don't feel they are a Hong Konger, which then has a byproduct. So, uh, uh, I'll tell you this, like, there were like, some NGOs that would have programs hate, hoping to, to uh, no, you know, the Commission on Youth, they would try to have programs aiming non-Chinese kids, and people would not apply. And they, a lot of times we would assume that they're too lazy, or they just want to do, which is in fact a, a factor. I'm not denying that a lot of times they are in fact lazy. But I spoke to a lot of kids and they would immediately dismiss the stuff, because they're like, it's not for us. How do you know? I don't know, Hong Kong's not my home, I don't feel like I'm at home, why would they care about me? You, you immediately dismiss because you don't feel this is part of your home, and you feel that nobody cares about you, so it's kind of like you have not built that relationship with Hong Kong, and therefore you feel no one's here to help me out, I don't care, it's, it's so depressing. So, it's a really weird thing, I've been very lucky as in that my parents have been more open-minded, I'm kind of far-sighted, where they're like, no, we have to invest in this education. In my family, honestly, education was number one. We would not go on trips, we would not go to like camps or in summer and all stuff. Education was the number one, because that's what my parents believed in. But a lot of other families don't think that as well. A lot of the other families just say, just get a job, just work whatever, get a salary and we're good to go. So it's a very diverse issue. However, based on what I've met and spoken to people, the biggest thing is that is when you don't identify Hong Kong as your home, you automatically just feel like an outsider and you're just surviving. 
and you're, just, you're, not, you're never happy. You don't feel like, I want to make Hong Kong proud. Like, when I go overseas, I feel like I'm representing Hong Kong. So automatically, I want to do good. I'm encouraged, I'm self-motivated, but others don't think that way as well. So I, I get your point, but I, I, I feel like the core issue is the Hong Kong, and if you feel Hong Kong is your home, you want to do more for it. That's my view. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, just want to say thank you uh, for your talk. Oh, um, so I noticed that throughout the talk, language is always being emphasized of uh, the topic. So I'm a little bit more interested actually about your uh, personal experience. So you have such great, I would say, intercultural communication, communication skills, language skills. How did you find yourself becoming a comedian as you are right now? Okay, so like comedy was just something I really liked. I would, when I was younger, I used to watch a lot of stand-up comedy. And I told myself, one day before I die, I want to try comedy. That was like, but you know, people, I want to do the bunch of I want to do the, I was like, I want to go on stage and make strange laugh. That was my thing. And I did not know when or where, but I just told myself that. So 10 years ago, I saw an article in the newspaper that said, you know, comedy competition. And I decided, hey, let me try it, whatever, you know, nothing to lose. So I did it, I joined it, I loved it, and I just kept doing it. So I was willing to do, perform wherever I could, because like 10 years ago, there was nothing much. Maybe one cafe, one bar, you know, you're like, whatever, who cares, just go do it. And over time, I built it. Now, I used to run my own one-man uh, web design company, so I automatically have this business mindset. So no matter what I do, I try to think like, how can I grow this, what can I do more with, how can I capitalize itself? So over the years, I was like, how much can I build my brand as a comedian? So it was not just a hobby, it was like, what next, what next? So for example, like, like the, 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 the laugh that I just mentioned, right? So this is like something we just made up because I've been privileged enough to go to uh, different countries to perform at comedy festivals. Now, so Hong Kong doesn't really have a real festival. There's a comedy festival, but it's more like basically a bunch of English comedians coming in, performing, and that's it. But what about Hong Kong? You know, they're nothing representing Hong Kong. And last year, we decided, let's do something. We did it, we did some Cantonese shows, all good. This year was like a whole month, you know? So we're trying to build something like that. So comedy was, I love comedy. I love the fact that it can talk about things you don't want to talk about. I love the fact that it can kind of, kind of connect with so many different people who would never listen to your story. Like, because of my comedy, I've had the board of directors of different charities listen to what I have to say, only because they're like looking at it from a comedy point of view. They're like, come and entertain us, but without realizing it, I'm talking about these issues. Like, oh, this is a good point, right? That kind of issue. So that's how the whole journey began. It's just more of an, I love comedy, and I wanted to do it, and I kept at it. That's basically it. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Other questions? Any other questions? By all means. All right, over there. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so I was thinking about your um, earlier example about the, the, the old guy, the, the little guy in the NTR, and your two mindsets. And I've been thinking, actually, how do you um, adapt to this mindset? And uh, from, what I, from what I've reflected, uh, I thought it's, um, it's important to keep distance from the subject, so not to take it too seriously, so that you won't mind, and then you can start to find the interesting angle out of it. So how, how exactly do you achieve that? Okay, so yeah, you're very correct. So when I first started doing comedy, I took it very personally. Like, let's say I went on stage, I performed, and I, I might have said the same joke, which was awesome last night, and today no one's laughing, and I would be like, oh man, you know, what's wrong? Would I say something wrong? You know, that's uh, I would be, I would beat myself up, and I'm like, oh man, you know, I'm not good. Maybe I'm not meant for this and stuff like that. But over the years, you would uh, deal with a lot of failure with your life and everything, and you kind of live, you realize that the world will keep turning, and you kind of like look, look, learn to past it. So I learned not to be so personal about it. There's, it's still a very big challenge. All that when things happen to me, and I'm just like, oh man, I can't believe that happened. Like uh, when I was around 18 years old, what there was a moment in my life I hated the fact that I was Indian. The reason was because like uh, I was in all boys school, and it was really hard to meet girls, right? So one of the methods that we tried to meet girls was these really useless inter-school dance balls. And basically, they, they talk to another school, like, hey, you want to come dance together? Right? And they're like, da, da, da. and they would come to our school for a meeting. Now, what happened was that the first meeting, everyone was, hello, my name is so-and-so, my name is so-and-so. And one girl, when it was my turn to introduce myself, she was like, hey, hey, hey. just like kind of moved away. And I was like, oh, did I do something wrong? Like, I mean, I haven't even said hi yet. And I was really upset. I was like, why can't I just be like any other guy? Why is it that everything I do, I gotta explain myself twice? When I go to a store and I have to be like, oh, what's it called, Joe Manga? I'm like, ah, oh. when I go outside, people like, say stuff about me. Why can't I just wear the same clothes and just be normal, right? And I didn't like that. But it took me a lot of self-reflection over like two or three years, writing journals and thinking about it, talking to people, my parents, all that stuff. And I was like, you know what? 
There's no right or wrong ethnicity. There's no right or wrong race. I am who I am, so I have a choice. I can either wake up every day and hate myself, or I can wake up every day and say, okay, how can I play the game now? How can I use this to my advantage? So I try my best to use my, the fact that I'm a so-called minority to my advantage, where I automatically stand out in the crowd. So without my doing anything, if I come on stage and say something, even if I'm not funny, you remember me as, a, oh, the guy with the little goatee, oh, the brown guy, you know, I will stand out from the crowd. And I was using that to my advantage. So I would try to shift my mindset like that. So using more of a business point of view, like how can I make, take advantage of the situation to all those self-help books, so like, you know, opportunity, not gay, is not gay, and all that kind of stuff, right? So all the, I've read through, I've done all the typical self-help books, like Seven Habits, uh, Anthony Robbins, all that stuff, dude. So it was over the years of running a business, dealing with reality, self-reflection, and kind of realizing that I have a choice of living a happy day or a sad day, it's really how I think. It's all my, it's all my attitude. So over time, I've kind of like just said, every day when I go out, I could either look at the situation and say, this is wrong, this is right, or I could just say, give me some comedy, give me some material, guys. And when that happens, I write it down and I make money off of it. So my, one of my best moments in my life is that when my classmates from school paid for tickets to come to my show and hear about me talk about how they discriminated me in school, <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, no refunds, you know, that's what it's up. So that, that, you get my point, so it's kind of like that mindset. So which is like, I, the introduction you heard, like one of my favorite books is The Art of War, and that is a really good book that taught me that really is, it's how you play the game. It's not about you know, my, my army or what money I have, it's like how you play the game with what you have, and that's what I learned from that book the most, which is what helped me a lot. Cool, thank you. All right, cool. How are we doing on time, Sarah? Okay, so we have like time for one or two more questions. I'm sure we'll get to get back time, yeah? So something I've heard relatively often in Hong Kong coming from the US, people will say, oh, you're from America, it must be so hard being from a country that is so, so racist. Thankfully, we are here in Hong Kong where there are no racial problems. And I've heard that so many times. I'm wondering whether or not with the notion of comedy being largely about shared experiences or common experiences, how you deal with people who don't acknowledge that those problems exist. I mean, you're talking about accidental education or getting the healthy food along with your meal or something, but do you ever have a problem where you need to sort of actually justify the existence of the problem that your jokes are about to your audience? Or if, I'm wondering if that kind of denial has come up in your experience. Um, I, I don't think it was in denial. They could only assume that I guess that's how it is because they never experienced it. And also it's the way I word it where I'm telling you a story about myself, so you can't really deny that it happened to me or not. But you are correct. There are, there are a bunch of people who live in Hong Kong who live in a different bubble. So I'll give you a prime example. It was one day I went in the morning to Team So Wai, to Moon that side, right? To Moon side to give a talk. And um, it was to a school where there were like 30 ethnic minority kids. And I gave a talk to the whole assembly of the school. The objective was they wanted the, the Chinese students to see a, basically an ethnic minority person speaking Cantonese, just be a fun guy, and hopefully encourage them not to look down or discriminate against the other 30 kids. All right, I did that in the morning. The free gig, whatever, I enjoyed it all the cool. Early morning. The same night, I had a private event. I was, I was invited to basically the MC for a private party for a bunch of Indians in Hong Kong. And I'm talking like, this is not like just Indian. These are like rich Indians. I'm talking like ridiculously rich Indians, okay? Ritz Carlton, ballroom, party starts at 11 p.m., right? So that means the party until 4 or 5 in the morning on like a weekday because they had nothing better to do. So I'm over there doing this gig, and I'm thinking to myself, like, these guys have so much money that they don't know what to do with their lives. And just less than, you know, 13 hours ago, I was up talking to fellow Indians as well, who are, you know, basically making ends meet. Or, like, their goal of a dream job is if I work in a parking shop and I make $10,000 a month, life is good. And I was like, this is so bizarre. They both fall in the same category, yet they live a very different life. So the kid who, let's say, is living in Team Sawai, if he goes and walks into a restaurant, the okay, people are like, what do you want, what do you want, right? But these same people who are risk halted, they could order around the staff, like, you, get me this, give me that. And what I find is that when I go to a lot of these clubs, like American club, country club, it's reverse racism, where the non-Chinese can now kind of like point fingers at the staff, and like, what's wrong, give me this. And the staff have to speak to them in English, because, hey, that's how it is, right? These are the members. 
which is really bizarre. And I'm like, this is so strange. So suddenly now, the Chinese are the minority in this room where they're getting pointed around and they're getting discriminated against because of these people being of higher status. So if you ask, let's say, the Indians who went to the Ritz Carlton and had a party, is there racism in Hong Kong? In their role, no. It's great. They're like, my kids go to school, we go on vacation, everyone's nice to us. I don't get it. What's the problem? Yeah, maybe one or two people look at, look, look at us bomb, but that's about it. But talk to the kid who's living in the team, he's like, is Hong Kong racist? Like, uh, yeah. I go to the basketball court, no one wants to play with me. I walk on the street, people are checking my ID card. I take the MTR, no one sits next to me. I take the bus, no one wants, no one wants to sit next to me. You know, it's all these different perspectives. So it really depends on the person. I, I am really blessed I get to run around and go to different worlds. And I'm really observant. Like, I really like to look like, oh, this is really interesting. I joke about how when I sit on a minibus, the last seat taken is the seat next to me. And I say, this is great, this Hong Kong space is so precious. I enjoy it. I'm like, I'm like, huh, don't sit, take the next one, you know? I play around with that, but not everyone thinks that way as well. But yeah, so it depends on who you're talking about, what world they live in. So Hong Kong's really bizarre things like that. Yeah, cool. Any final questions? I think one right there. Yeah. Okay, final question. Hi, David. Thanks for dropping by. So, uh, Hong Kongers, we are very stressed and uh, our mindset a little bit screwed up. So, since you have a chance to perform bilingually, do you think that Hong Kong people have a slightly different sense of humor? Okay, so, perfect timing because like I said last night, right, I had one show English, one show Cantonese, which, which is the best. I love stuff like that. Hong Kongers are not, uh, basically, I'll put it this way, they're the hardest audience to make laugh, but the moment you make them laugh and they, they, you basically win them over, they want a party, man. They're ready to go. They're like, let's rock it out. So this is what I find. It's kind of like a steep learning curve. So the moment you get through that curve, that steep curve, boom, it's, it's awesome. So what I find is that when I write jokes and I can make a Hong Kong audience laugh, I'm very confident that joke will work anywhere in the world. So it's not so much about being high stress, it's about our mindset. So Hong Kong has a problem with the entertainment sector where people are so driven by idols, by celebrities. Because the entertainment is designed in a way that you're a celebrity first, and then you learn the skill. So many times when people have a, have a, a champion, like the first disc, it's average, like, oh, it's his first one, what do you expect, right? I'm like, what, what, what do you mean, what do you expect? You learn to sing, right? So it's a reverse thing. So when we do comedy shows before, people would not come to like, who are these guys, right? But you go overseas, comedy club, comedy show, the comedy show, who cares, right? Comedians, just watch the show. But here it's like, who are these guys? What is the topic? Then I would decide. The reason is because Hong Kong is so convenient that if I decide today to go watch a comedy show, I don't want to regret it. Because the sum cost is I could have gone next door one minute away to go to a cinema, one minute away to a restaurant, I could have stayed at home, saved my money, whatever. Whereas overseas, let's say Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, you go to a comedy show, that's a one hour drive, and it's yes or no. You know, you go there, that's it. So either have a good time or don't. That's the thing, right? So I would say Hong Kong, yes, we are very stressed. We are very calculative. I'm calculative. When I go buy anything, I'm like, is this the best deal I can get? Can I get it cheaper, all this stuff? We do that. But what I do find is that we forget the reason why we are such, we are like this. Because at the end of the day, you know, when I travel the world, when I go to let's say Melbourne, I, I remember going to Melbourne the first year, and I was like, oh, blue skies, oh, space, slow pace, oh, so nice, right? First week, I'm like, Hong Kong, fast, man, so good, <laughs> Week number two, I'm like, oh, still blue skies, all right, okay. Hey, you're all the way, I, let me walk over to you, you're so far away, oh my god. When's the next bus? Oh, we're still waiting, oh, that's great. By the third week, I'm like, I don't care about the sky, okay? Where is the damn bus? I need to get there, I'm tired of waiting, coffee, I get it, dude, I'm jittery, let's go. You know, and I really, I'm still, I still have that, that value of like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Hong Kong, same deal. Just that you have to remind yourself that at the end of the day, is it all about running? Or is it about, you know, taking, it's like the, the typical thing of like, stop and smell the roses. So uh, one time in my life and everything, you know, I was like thinking to myself, you're so busy planting roses, you forgot why you planted them in the first place, which is something Hong Kong has all the time. And I myself find it as well, that I just keep doing it. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm just doing, doing, doing. What's the point? So in comedy as well, that I'll give you this, this short tip before we end is that uh, when I first started comedy, it was purely that I get to go on stage and tell jokes, it's so cool. But 10 years later, that excitement is not there anymore. It's kind of grown into a career where I'm thinking the business aspect of like, okay, you know what, I gotta do this gig, I have this, this is my time, I gotta go there. And when I did like my comedy show last night, the last thing I was worried about was the performance path, where that used to be the most exciting thing. But now it's like, I gotta worry about the lighting, which the people come in, all that kind of stuff. So it's all your perspective and all that. So Hong Kong, we always forget because life is so fast. So we often forget why we even do what we're doing, which is one of the things about Hong Kong. Yeah, cool. Great. That's a
wonderful final word. Let's thank you Ed, for his wonderful <laughs> Thank you.